Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of Releasing Your Inner Dragon with Drake and Marie. I am Max Alexander Drake, or Drake as I'm known. I'm an award-winning novelist. I teach writing all over the world. I write in almost every media from TV, movies, games, nonfiction, fiction, and I do this podcast and talk about writing. As always, I'm here with my co-host Marie. My name is Marie. I am a fantasy author and a YouTuber with a channel on fantasy world building. As always, if you enjoy the content that we're spitting out, please share this to your writer friends, tell people about it, like it, subscribe to it. I know every YouTube video you've ever seen says this, and I get it, but it actually is the only way you can repay us for all of this information we're giving you. It really, eventually it comes down to the point of, do we want to keep doing this or not? Is it, is it worth our time to do this? And if you feel that it is, subscribing, liking, sharing is how you show us that you want us to continue doing this. So please do that. All right. Today, we're going to be doing another writer's journey. Uh, this one I'm going to call the all hope is lost moment, because today we're going to be talking about what to do after you finished your manuscript, like the self-editing part of it. Yes, you've got to get a professional editor. You, you should absolutely hire somebody to go through it and, and do your thing, especially if you're self-publishing. If you're, if you're trade publishing, tra traditional publishing, agents pretty much are today's editors in the industry. So if you, if you do have an agent, that agent is going to go through and, and edit the crap out of your work before it gets to the publisher. And then the publisher also has editors in-house that are going to hammer on that. But if you are, you know, indie publishing, everything rests on your shoulders. And so you do need to get a second set of eyes that aren't yours. You do need to get, you know, somebody that you're paying for. But before then, you really want to understand how you can take advantage of some things that will force you to edit your own work from arm's length that, that will, like you're so close to it and you love it so much. And as I've said many, many times, you're always doing two books at the same time. You're doing one on paper and one in your head. And that doesn't work. You have to learn how to put the one in your head on paper because that's the only one that you're giving away. So we're gonna talk about some things today about how to think about this and, and little tricks that we use and, and everything like that. So I'll start off there, Marie. I mean, what do you think, what, are, what, are, what is probably the number one thing that you think uh, that you do that helps you the most in editing your own work? I'm gonna talk about the editing right at the end of the book. And it comes when I'm actually narrating the book because I, I self-narrate my audiobooks. That might change in the future, but at the moment I do it with self-narration. So that narration is my last catch. And what I've found is that even if I do eventually get professional narrators, I will probably still go through the exercise of narrating and recording and re-listening to the book because what it does in that one huge chunk, doing the book as a whole, is it gives me a very clear understanding of the book overall and things like in this last book, in the Ducal Air, when I was going through it, I hit the word per permeated, I think for the eighth time. And I was like, man, I use this word a lot. Now, I only use it like once per chapter, but I used it in about 15 16 chapters so I went through and I searched for it and I eliminated it then there was another word gentle I was like yeah I use gentle a lot let me check you know and then so you you discover like repeated content that stretches across chapters because we all know to check in the chapter in the paragraph and so on sometimes across chapters you'll reuse a word um and I know, for example, that there are fans who've commented on how many times Brandon Sanderson used the word haunches in Mistborn. And now that I've said it, you're never going to read that word in the same light again. <laughs> yeah. And this is where we're a little opposite on that. And I get it. I, I'm very sensitive to a lot of things that don't matter. Like there are things that I edit that everyone's like, I don't understand why you do that. No one is going to notice that. And it's weird for me to take that side in this discussion because, <laughs> you know, I do, 
and, and we're going to look at some tools that I use and everything like that to make sure that in a chapter, I'm not overusing, you know, those really unique words like pernicious, mm -hmm. but I'm not as concerned with it if I'm using it, you know, eight times in a 150,000 word book or 15 times in a 150,000 word book, because I know for the most part, no one sits down and just reads a 150,000 word book. They read it a little bit tonight and a little bit tomorrow night, and maybe they skip a couple of nights because of life and, and so on and so forth. So I'm not as concerned with it. And like the haunches thing, several things. One, you always have to remember this is subjective. You're never going to please everybody. But when it comes to something like that, where they're like, oh my goodness, you know, he used haunches, you know, whatever, 28 times. I don't even know. I'm just making up a number. Like that's really nitpicking. Like, like you are really it, digging. It is, deep. but it is. So, so to be fair to those people who bring it up, it is nitpicking, but it is because the word itself is a standout word. Right. If I read haunches once in a book, I'm going to remember it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Because it's it's not a, an often word. And it I guess is such a unique word. Yeah. That's something you have to like watch for if you use. Right. Yeah. And I agree with that. Yeah. And, and maybe it's just because I am such a simplistic writer. Hmm. Um, like the one of my favorite professional reviews of my work. And later I asked him, because I met him at a convention one time, he came up and introduced himself. And I was like, you know, did you mean that as a compliment or an insult? And he was like, oh, I meant that as an insult. He said, while Drake is a very immersive writer, he's a very simplistic writer. I never found myself marveling over his use of prose. And I took it as a compliment because I want you to watch a movie. You know, the, if you look at my reviews over and over again, you, you know, you'll get that. It's like watching a movie. I don't even realize I'm turning pages. I don't even realize that, that, that there's a book in front of me. That's what I want. And I feel like if you use those pernicious words, you end up having people not watch the movie. And so I tend to use very simple words. I mean, I get poetic every once in a while, or I, I'll use, and, and my Vocabulary has definitely grown over the last 20 years. I, I definitely will say that. But I think that's the reason why I don't know if I've ever used pernicious eight times in a book, because I don't know how many times I've used the word pernicious, because I don't even know how to spell the word pernicious. I'm not 100% sure of the definition of the word pernicious. I don't even know if I used it correctly in the sentence I just used it in. I think I did, but I'm only guessing. And so since my vocabulary, and, and that's, a, that's a, a side effect of me being dyslexic, me having a remedial ninth grade English education, me never going to college and being forced to read books that I don't want to read. So I never had to read, you know, the classics that don't make no damn sense. I got to read whatever I wanted to read. You know, I started with The Hobbit and moved into Conan and, you know, all of that other stuff, all my fantasy stuff. And some of those have some big words in them that I had to look up, but most it's pretty simplistic language. And so maybe that's the reason why I'm like, ah, do I really worry about the word pernicious? It's probably just yeah. because I just don't use big words like that. No, 100%. But it's also, I guess, really good for catching repeated actions. Shrugging and nodding, everybody should know to catch those and smiling and so on. But I found there was, there was a repeated word action that I went through. I think at the eighth or the ninth time, I was like, I'm turning into Robert Jordan and smoothing skirts. This has got to stop. <laughs> like, I cannot be doing this Robert Jordan thing. <laughs> the one criticism you, you hear repeatedly of him is, man, the amount of time those women smooth their skirts. <laughs> Catching that kind of action is also quite important. I had a lot of eye rolls. I had 40 eye rolls and I cut them down to 30. But you're still talking about over the whole novel, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, and it doesn't like it doesn't sound that much. But the thing is, like even Robert Jordan, right? There isn't that much skirt smoothing going on over the course of the entire series. Right. But it stands out enough to fans that they're like, do these women ever do anything else? Is it like ever? <laughs> right, you know? right. Because fans right. do notice it. And to play devil's advocate, mm. eye rolling tends to, it's sort of like said eye rolling will disappear whereas smoothing her skirts is 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 not a common thing to read yeah and so therefore it stands out more 
So you can probably have five eye rolls for every one smoothing <laughs> of skirts and they're about equal in, in how much it's going to affect the reader. So, you know, I do think about that. But the funny thing is, is when we were talking about this before we did the podcast, it did make me start going because I'm very, very, and we're going to get into it. I'm very insane on how I go through things and the tools that I use for getting stuff done. But since I write everything in individual documents, every chapter is its own document. I don't really worry about the whole thing, but now you're probably going to force me to, at the end of this, you know, at the end of the day, when everything's done, dropping all of them into my programs in one document, because the programs mm -hmm. that I use are based off of each document. Uh, now, of course, it's 200,000 words. So when I click the button to do something to tell me whatever information I'm looking at, I'm going to have to walk away and, and maybe go take a vacation before I come back, before it's done actually going through it. Because it already takes forever just with one 5,000 word chapter. So I write in a separate document and do base and do editing there up to where I'm happy with the chapter. And then I put the chapter in the completed document that I'm working on, the first draft document that I'm working on. So that when I edit, I edit the whole thing. And I, it, it works better for me as my process. Yeah. And I will say that Word has proved admirable in handling even 185,000 words. Oh, yeah. I've had no problems opening documents or anything like that. So right. Me doing everything in individual chapters is probably a throwback from the fact that I'm a professional typesetter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you're putting together a book, having each chapter in its own document and then being able to import them as, as their own books uh, inside of a, like I use InDesign. So you have the individual chapters and then it just, it gives you so much more flexibility. It allows you to make sure you're always starting on the correct side of the, uh, you know, it's always, you always start on the right side. You know, every chapter, it doesn't matter if the left side is blank at that point, mm -hmm. you always start a new chapter on the right side. And so by having them not as one document, I, I, I never have to worry about it. When I drop in the next book and, you know, the next chapter in that book, it always is going to start that, whether, it, whether like there's a page before it or not. I guess we'll, we'll get to that when we talk about tools because Word now has the most amazing tool sets for a typesetter. Mm, I haven't even looked at it. Well, from the perspective of, say, a self-publisher, right? Because you've, you've got to upload your, your final document into Amazon and it's got to be right. And they allow you now to set up your pages so that they vary, you know, so they've got that spine variation in the middle with a gutter. So all of that, you can do all that and have the pages do that. You can set the margins and the gutter and the everything so that the thing is exactly the size it's going to be when it's physically printed. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's fantastic. But you have to have the whole thing in one document to really right. see it. And then, of course, upload it as one document. Well, Amazon. And the great thing about Amazon when you do that, sorry, the great thing about Amazon when you do that is um, you don't even have to PDF it. You don't have to, you don't do, it, it takes Word docx's like straight. <laughs> it's fantastic. I haven't looked at it because I've, you know, I always use a high-end typesetting program my whole career, but I, but it's also, I don't want to give that control. Like the nice thing about using a typesetting program is when I make that PDF, the print version of the book and it goes to a printer or it goes to Amazon or whatever, I know, I know no, nothing can screw with that. The page is going to look exactly the way, you know, I've looked for it. I've already found all my widows. I've already found all my orphans. I've taken care of everything. So that's the other thing. Does, does word give you the ability to, 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 to manipulate your kernels, your kerning on an individual sentence basis on an individual paragraph basis uh, to get rid of your widows and orphans. And, and I know I'm using technical terms. So, so, an orphan is when you have a paragraph that the last line of the paragraph is one word long. Mm. And a widow is where you have a paragraph where the last line of the paragraph is on the next page. Mm. And both those two things as a professional typesetter are offensive to me because they look bad. It's not professionally done. And so the nice thing about using a professional typesetting program is you can, you can literally grab a paragraph and, and, tweak it it's called current using its kerning and stuff like that where the reader can't tell the difference between the paragraphs but you can literally shove things together at such a microscopic level that 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 orphan or that widow will pop up and you have the ability to make your pages look really really nice or even stretch them out like sometimes the the orphan is a longer word and mm. you if you start compressing it too much it, you, it can visibly tell 
So you can expand it a little bit, have a few other words drop down there. So the line is now a little bit longer, maybe three words, four words or whatever. And so it looks better. Um, and I realize that's insane, like detail that I, that I put into my stuff, but you know. So yes, the, the answer to your question is yes. Word now okay. supports kerning and you can take a paragraph and be like, and you can even set a specific style for it and be like this style or this style, you know, shrink it or whatever. Um, and you can go into thumbnail view, which, which I do because I like to check that I don't have any blank pages anywhere or anything weird like that. So you can go into to that kind of view and check that. And then, um, you know, you can have different sections to have like, so the first, the front matter of the book can have like Roman numeral numbering. And then you have, you know, the proper page number starting at page one, which is the first text, all of that. You have to know what you're doing. <laughs> like, you know, but... I mean, I use footers and headers in Word as well. Yeah. So, you know, I'm very specific on how I set up. Well, let me let me share my screen since we're since we're here. I'll yeah. chase this rabbit. So, since we're here, let's just get into this. For those of you listening on a podcast, you're you're just gonna have to kind of visualize this. I'll try to explain it as I go, but you know, head on over to YouTube if you really want to see this because this will be on the YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. So. Um, since we're talking about styles and we're talking about makeup of, of Word and everything like that, I've shown this before. A lot of you know that I have my own Word document. So this is a blank document for me. Now, this is a Genesis of Living one. That's why it says GOB. Uh, I do a blank document for every different, you know, book series that I'm working on because they'll have, I'll use different fonts or whatever. I have my beta question section. I have my chapter breakdown section, which maybe we'll talk about one time on a different um, podcast or whatever. But this allows me to just really start typing and know that I'm using the correct fonts that, that I want to use and so on and so forth. I don't normally have this styles palette open because I have them also open the styles ribbon. But the thing about Word is every time you hit one of these buttons, like if you bold something, it's going to create a new style over here. And so if you ever look at your styles palette, which you just open by clicking this little button here. If you haven't paid attention to styles, you're going to have thousands of styles or hundreds, you know, of styles in there. And the reason why that's so difficult is when a typesetter is going to do that, they have to, if they want to change something, like say I send this to a publisher and I'll get, let me pull one of my actual chapters. So I'm working on my chapter. I've sent this to them. So I'm using Palantino uh, font for this, but what, let's say the, the Publishers like, no, 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 we're going to use Times New Romans. Or we're going to use Courier. Or, well, I don't know why you'd use Courier, but they want to use whatever. Since everything is set up in styles, all I do is right click on the, the body, which is what every paragraph is, modify it, change it to whatever font they want to change it to, and it changes it through the entire thing. They don't have to do anything. If they don't, you know, if they want to do a different letter in the beginning uh, of, the, of the chapter, um that i've used or if they want to use a different font for chapter headings or usually you do, you'll do art for chapter headings you won't even use uh text for chapter headings but um so it just kind of depends on what they're doing and so i have all of my styles already set up and it makes it so easy to typeset let's say you're doing the amazon thing and you're uploading your word document amazon likes you to use styles because styles embed the fonts automatically mm -hmm. Amazon likes embedded fonts because if their font isn't embedded, it doesn't know what to do with it. And then your, your display can be weird. Um, just to show what I mean with the final view, let me share. Okay, so this is the final copy of Ducal Air, the final print copy, because I have two final copies, one of them being for the ebook and one of them being for the print book, because they are obviously somewhat different. And you can see here how the guttering is set up so that it's got the spine of the book mm. with the Roman numeral contents. Um, That's called the formatter, by the way. Mm? That section is called the formatter. Okay, formatter, yeah. So this is all formatter. And then here we start with number one. Yep. Right? And then if you want a view where you're just checking for like weirdnesses, you can check your um, chapters, make sure your you know, um, specific um, chapter headings are right. Uh, I use these little flare-ons, these little pictures as flare-ons of a daffodil. A flare-on is a scene break, for mm -hmm. those of you who didn't know the term. 
um, and then you can check for your what you called your I didn't know that term orphan and widowed but I check for them too because they're very annoying <laughs> um, and you can fix you can fix that with a kerning on your paragraph mm -hmm. yeah um, I didn't realize that word did because this basically is what I'm doing in InDesign PageMaker was the old king back in the day but InDesign mm -hmm. pretty much has has taken over but yeah the only difference is, is like so like for me I start every new chapter on the right, which is the traditional way to do it. Yeah. Most people don't care about that, especially in digital printing when every page mm. is, it, you know, you're, if you're indie pressing, you're paying for every page. Exactly. And so to have a bunch of blank pages in your book, you're still paying for them as if they have ink on them or not. But still for me, um, I'm a traditionalist when it comes to all this stuff. And so I still like to have my chapters all start on that right-hand page. Um, it just makes me feel better. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, I go through and do that. And then by the way, that at, after that's all done, you have what's called your back matter. So you have your mm -hmm. four matter, you have the actual book, and then you have the back matter. Yeah. So this is, this is my back matter over here. Um, uh, where, you know, there's a little bit of about the author, there's the character references, and then the glossary, you know, things I've learned, do not put a, um, do not put an actual table in a book, put a picture of the table in a book. <laughs> an actual table gets broken up in weird ways. Well, and again, that's the difference. Like the reason why, even if I was going to use Word, which I'm not, yeah. but even if I was going to use Word to typeset, I would still turn it into a PDF because mm -hmm. at that point, when you upload it to Amazon, Amazon can't do anything to change it. If it's a Word document, they, they don't. No, this renders exactly. This renders Again. precisely. Well, but you just said your tables don't. No, so. um, I, I said word because, and that's because of the, that's because it's actually more for the flow documents that I put the pictures in. Hmm. Because the flow, because the pages are unexpected sizes, right? Because it depends talking on about, the talking device. About e -books, by the way. I'm talking about ebooks, yeah. yeah. So for the ebooks, I put um, pictures in not right. actual tables because the problem is an uh, ebook will in that flow view right it'll it'll go very weird with the tables because you're not in control of anything the reader is correct, correct. that was a hard thing for me to get get yes. used to to go from <laughs> i want my page to look exactly like this to i don't have any control over this the reader has 100 okay. control over the font the size the page layout oh man i was it, it broke my heart when i made yeah. my first ebook 15 years ago or whatever i literally was in remorse because i couldn't make the page look the way i wanted it to look but anyway so that's these are all the things that we're talking about this has nothing to do with self-editing though we've kind of gotten off the track so i want to yes. kind of get back into that but this just shows you especially as an if you're going to indie press which that's where i'm heading down the path now that's where marie is right now you really kind of have to think about this stuff because it does rest on your shoulders and so if you're not, the reason why I have my blank documents, the reason why I'm so adamant on just use my styles, don't use, you know, the italic button or the bold button is because at the end of this project, I've got to be the one that typesets this. I've got to be the one that makes it look good for the print version. And trust me, I've done like, I typeset back in early in my career, I would typeset like anthologies. And so you'd have 20 different authors send 20 different short stories and they would have, each one of them would have a hundred different styles that were completely different from everybody else's styles. So now you have 3000 styles that you're having to go through and turn into the same style. My darkest moment was probably when I was doing the typesetting for the Hidden Blade for the first book, because I knew nothing and I did not really understand word you know, um, I had used bold and italics and I could not figure out how to make the EPUB book look right. It lost italics halfway through. Some of the chapters were half bolded, like it was crazy. The EPUB, right? And yep. the only way that I could see what it looks like is to take the Word document, to upload it into Calibri, to have Calibri generate an EPUB, to then take that EPUB onto my phone and open it in my phone. And that was the only way I could validate it. And that process alone takes 10 minutes. And I made 30 versions in the end. And finally, in the end, I killed every style in the document. I killed everything and I redid the styles properly. 
because it was the only way to get that thing to work right. So take this from a person who suffered through a very long night. <laughs> so the first ebooks that I was making, like I said, 15, 18 years ago, I had to write them in notepads. Mm. Like I, I had to hand code them because there was no program that would do anything to, you know, Amazon wasn't doing its thing. Um, InDesign didn't have the ability to, to, to make them or anything like that. It does now. So now, you know, I, I take all my files after my print version. I just duplicate them over to a different directory. I call it the ebook version. And then I go in and I, there's, there's still some things that I have to do to, to kind of finagle it. Um, especially if you want like, you know, linkable chapter, um, you know, the, um, the table of contents and everything like that. And I'm actually glad that I learned the coding by hand because it does make me understand if something goes awry, if InDesign doesn't do exactly what it, what it should have done or what I thought it was going to do, I can then just go into the, the actual EPUB. I can, I can explode it, go in and edit it, and then the, put it back the together. Junior, let the junior writer just say uh, again here, Word, totally, Amazon reads the H1 tag of Word for your table of contents. So you upload that and it automatically pulls the yep. table of contents. Well, again, so does InDesign has gotten very, very yeah. advanced in making ebooks because I mean, it is a professional type saving program and everyone makes ebooks. So you've got to, if you're in the industry, you're going to have to cater to your customers. All right, let's get off of uh, typesetting because that's not really about editing. <laughs> but it is something to think about because especially if you're going to be indie pressing, the number one thing that I tell people when you're editing your own work, you need to edit out loud. Now, Marie went through and did, and, and I know that you're also doing editing out loud even before you did the audiobook. I know you're doing that. So, but that's what I tell people. If you really want to get better at editing, the, the number one thing you can do that instantly makes you a better editor of your own work is to read it out loud. It won't fix everything, but it literally puts you so far ahead of the game. So I'm doing that constantly. It'll also clear up your pronouns because pronoun yeah. misuse. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, it also, you know, I also do all my dialogue with crappy accents because I'm not a great actor, but when I'm editing, I'm just by myself, my shih tzu's at my feet. He ain't saying nothing. He's not picking on me if I do crappy job. And so I just do everything out loud and I even do crappy accents because what it, what it really does is it makes me hear what it sounds like, what the dialogue, does, this, does it sound like something somebody would say? Is it natural? And I feel like there's so many times where in my private writers group or with my, with my private clients that I take on that I'm reading, I, I'll read a piece of dialogue and I'll go, have you ever heard somebody say something like this? Like, it's so clunky and so, well, Jane, what we need to do is we're going to go down the street and we're going to gather up three bananas and we're going to take those three bananas. And it's like, who has ever said that or talked like that? It's like, and then they, when you finally point it out, they're like, oh yeah. And I'm like, now read it out loud. And when you read it out loud, you start going, oh, that's, that is not something that sounds like somebody would say. So, and then also having it read to you. Some people, I don't do that, but you know, like what you said, Marie, recording okay. it and listening to it, you can also get word to read it to you. I know a lot of people that do that now that they just, they read along as the computer reads it out loud so that they can hear it and see it. I don't do it, but I've heard that a lot of people. I do that sometimes, um, but only very sometimes. It does help if you need to make sure that you haven't left anything out. Like mm -hmm. you haven't left out a preposition or, you know, a word, because oftentimes we'll just read over something like our eyes will just literally skip the fact that, you know, you're missing a word in the sentence or you've got a repeated word or whatever the case is. Whereas, of course, an AI just literally word for word. Right. You know. Well, and that's the beautiful thing about reading out loud, because mm -hmm. it slows you down. It slows you down to the rate that you talk. Um, and that's going to make you go, oh, crap, I missed of in this sentence. There should have been an of here. or I wrote of, but it should have been an it. And every time I've read this in my head, I've always put it there, but I wrote of. And so, you know, that will help you out tremendously. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Another thing that will help you out, and this is vital, you have to have other people reading your stuff. You know, call beta readers, you, you know, 
a lot of people are like, well, how do you get your beta readers? For me, I'm lucky. I've got a large fan base. I am out in the public. You know, when I meet somebody that that seems very intelligent to me, that is actually into not only what I do, but but you know, the genre that I'm in and other authors that I appreciate reading, they don't freak me out because I do have some fans that, you know, a little scary. I'm kind of glad there's a table between us sometimes. And then they're also, almost every one of them also want to be writers as well. So those are kind of the criteria that I look for. And if I find that person, which I've been doing this for 15 years now, I'll be like, hey, how would you like to, I mean, you're already a huge fan of mine. How'd you like to read stuff a year to up to two years before it's actually published? And so, of course, most of them are very excited to do that. But everyone needs that, that feedback. You can get beta readers. There's program. There's uh, websites out there for that people sign up to be beta readers, and they want you know the, it's a quid pro quo. So you have to beta read other people to get credits for people to beta read your stuff. You can join a writers group, and they can be your beta readers. It really doesn't matter. The only thing it, that I always say is don't get anyone who cares about you. You can't use your mom to beta read your stuff because she loves you and she's never going to kick you in the teeth like you deserve to be kicked in the teeth. And I even tell that to my beta readers. I'm like, if all you do after you read something my end is go up, oh, you did it again, Drake, you're awesome. I'm like, you can wait until it's published and you can write that as a five star review on Amazon because that doesn't help me at all. I don't want you to tell me I'm awesome. I want you to show me a line that, that was confusing to you or, you know, maybe a situation that you thought was going to go different and it didn't feel realistic to you or something. Give me something that I can, even if I completely disagree with you, I don't care, but it makes me think. And that's, you know, that open-mindedness is the second step, not only, you know, reading it out loud, but letting other people read it and then getting that feedback. And every bit of it, I listen to. If you arbitrarily dismiss, dismiss anybody who tells you something, you're a fool. Even if they're 100% wrong, it's happened many, 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 many times to me. But even though that's the case, every single thing that is presented to me, I look at. I go, hmm, that sentence is confusing. Let me go take a look at it and let me see if it actually is confusing. And even if I don't think it is, it still probably will get tweaked a little bit because I, you know, having to look at that sentence on its own as an island makes me go, actually, I could write this a little bit better. And then I'll just tweak it a little bit. Whether I use the person's suggestion or not, whether I, you know, it's still, it makes it that much better. And so getting that feedback is vital. That's the, th that's the big thing to me is, is even if you don't agree with the feedback, go and look, mm -hmm. go and check and make sure. And maybe just think, like, could, I, could I make it a little better? Because the answer is inevitably, yes, of course you can oh. make it. <laughs> You can edit forever. Yeah. And if you, if you come, if they come back with feedback, like this part of the plot doesn't work for me, don't discard that. Really think about your plot too, at that point, like, don't just go, oh, well, you know, it didn't work for them. Like maybe there's something small you can tweak to just right. make it more clear what you were doing. Well, let me, let me share my screen and kind of show how I take advantage of, of getting that information. You know, you saw at the, at the end of my blank sheet, there is, I don't know why I'm scrolling with my mouse. There is my beta questions section. Hmm. One of the things that I learned really early on when I was doing writers groups 20, 25 years ago is I would get back typos. Like, oh, you missed a comma here. Oh, you, you put an of instead of an it. And I'm like, I don't give a crap about that. That's not why I'm here. Like, that'll get fixed eventually somewhere down the road. That doesn't help me. And so I learned very quickly that when I went to my writer's group and I had, you know, something that I was reading, I asked specific questions. And so that's what my beta section is. They're usually anywhere from 11 to 15 questions. Um, the first four are always the same. Actually, this one's different because yeah. it is. The next four are normally my first four. So what was it on the opening page that pulled you in? Be specific. What about the entire chapter? What grabbed you and made you continue reading? Were you able to visualize the scene? Were there any details I could elaborate on more? Like those are questions that I want to know. I think I did my job, but I want to find out if you did your job. Just like the last two questions or the last three questions, somehow I dropped one of my normal questions. 
Sometimes that happens. So my last three questions are usually, what questions did the chapter leave you with? I don't know why it's not in here. That's, that's usually a question that's in here as a standard. It must've gotten deleted on this copy at some point. And then at any time when you stop reading, where and why? And if you did finish it, why are you gonna read the next chapter? What is driving you? Because for me, it's all about that. It's about the emotions. And then in between the questions are all very specific to this chapter. You know, how do you, like, this is an introductory chapter. So how do you feel about our dairy? What do you like or dislike about him? At this point, are you interested enough in following him as a main character? Why? Notice these are all open-ended questions because I know why I would follow our dairy. I know what I like about our dairy, but that doesn't mean Jack. It only matters about the readers. And so getting that feedback is vital to me to see if I have accomplished the goal that I'm hoping to accomplish. It's about the readers. I love what I wrote, but do they love what I wrote? And so that's why all these questions are in here, you know, the way that I word them. Um, and, and it's whatever, I'm asking about, okay, I just introduced this piece of magic, right? Or there's this piece of world building. What, what do you think of that? Or, you know, what are some questions you have here? And that's why I said, the, the, do you have any questions when you leave this? That's, that's one of my standard questions. So I'm gonna have to put it back in here. Although this has pretty much been beta read to hell. You really do, when you get that opportunity to be in a writer's group, you want to take advantage of it. You want to make sure you're getting the most out of it that you possibly can. And a big part of that is going and prepared with actual question. Hey, I just killed Bob in this chapter. How'd that make you feel? And if you're hoping that they're like, oh my God, my soul was crushed because I love Bob. And instead you get, oh, I was so happy when Bob died. I hate that character so much. Then you have failed. Like, you, you probably should think a little bit different about how you have been writing Bob if everybody's very happy that, they're, that he's dead and you really want it to be a soul-crushing, you know, tragic experience for your readers. Um, and so that's cause for concern. That, that makes you go, oh, I should probably go back and look at this. Other people are instrumental in you self-editing your work. Now you have to be open-minded. You have to look at everything as if it could possibly be factual because if you ever get arrogant, if you ever, you know, if I was to go, I've been teaching this stuff for 15 years. What do you know? You're nothing. No, every single one. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Let me check that. I think you're wrong because I don't think I would have done that, but let me go look. I might have. I mean, I'm a human. I make mistakes all the freaking time. And so just having that, that open-mindedness is vitally important. Anything to add on? Because you have a beta reader group as well. I do. So I, I got my beta readers, well, partially through my, my platform because I built my YouTube platform as part of the decision to go, you know, uh, with indie publishing. So I now have a, a group of beta readers and I put out a call for beta readers when I, you know, I'm ready to look for them. But then I also discovered the site called uh, Critique Circle which I highly recommend to anybody who's like, I have no idea how to get beta readers. Okay, so this site, you can go there, you can post a chapter, you critique other people's work, so you get exercise in critiquing work, and you get your own work critiqued by a variety of people. Just to give you guys an idea, if I go into my old novel, The Bugal Air, and I go to the, go to one of the ones that have got, because I, I've i republished chapters a few times. So some of them have got like a lot of crits and some of them very little. So this one has had like 12 people read this specific chapter, right? And I can say, view all the crits together. And then you get these notes, which you get like per paragraph with commentary, um, and so on. And then at the end of the chapter, right at the end of the chapter, you can have questions that you ask and that people then answer in the, in the final chapter. So look at them stealing my stuff. <laughs> so it's, it's a really nice site for that purpose. These are random strangers on the internet, so they don't care if they hurt your feelings. <laughs> you know? um, that, that is the one thing you do also. I mean, there's a difference between somebody giving you what they feel is an honest critique, even if it doesn't. And then there, you know, you have trolls. You know, if somebody says, 
you know, I read your chapter and I feel like you probably should not be a writer. Maybe you can make more money picking up cans on the side of the street. Just ignore that's a troll. They, they don't deserve your attention, your response. Like, just ignore them. It's it's even if somebody says something like like I, one of my favorite stories is this one beta reader when he first started reading. Um, I gave him this chapter. It was actually the first chapter from the Genesis saga. And it's this lion man in a cage. And he's like, oh, you got to rewrite this, man. I, this, you, he's got so much potential for violence. And, and I know you're a really good writer of combat. And you've got to write. You've got to have him fight in this chapter. You just have to. And I'm like, no. Um, and then his second chapter is a fight scene where, you know, the lion man's out there fighting. And, but it's only a taste of it. It's only one little piece of this fight. And so he wrote, you know, you, you can't do this. You have to rewrite this. You, I want to see, you got to give me more. And I'm like, no. And what he doesn't realize is he's, he's actually giving me the answer I want. I want you to leave that first chapter wanting to see this guy fight. I want you to leave the second chapter going, okay, that was a taste, but I want more because that's what's going to drive you through that book. And so he wants, the reader wants to be satisfied all at one time. You know, it's sort of like that. Oh, I have this question. You have to, and I get this all the time too. Like, man, you have to answer this question right here. You cannot let me hang with this. I am dying to know what this is. I'm like, yeah, that's what I want you to do. I want you to die knowing what that is, because then you're going to keep reading to find out what that is. And if I had answered it, then what's the point of reading? And so, you know, those are answers that I love. And they're, the beta reader is 100% wrong. I'm 100% right. Because, you know, again, I want to drive you through that book. And I'm not going to satisfy you completely until the end. You know, that's when you're getting your total satisfaction. So, yeah, all of this is very, very important. And it's that's the next step to self-editing is you have to get other people giving you feedback. Now, one thing you said, Marie, that, that I do want to just gloss over. This has nothing to do with self-editing but you cannot become a better writer if you're not editing other people. You know, I've met so many writers that have said, oh, I'm not going to edit anybody else. Why would I make them better writers? Because it makes you a better writer, you idiot. That's why you do it. And so you have to edit other people. If you have no writers group in your area, go on to this critique circle. I think is what you said. Critique circle, And yeah. edit other people. Just edit like crazy. The more you edit, the better you will be as a writer. I promise you. Again, not about self-editing, but about becoming just a better writer. You have to edit other people. All right. So let me share my screen again. And let's let's get really in-depth on how, how crazy I get. So you've probably heard me talk about before, huh? We got to talk about macros. It's that right. time. <laughs> you've heard me talk about, you know, how I love Word and using the macros. And I have my bad word macro. And now the bad word macro is, you know, for me, and I'm going to put this up somewhere or something. Um, if you want it, send me an email. I'll see if I can send it to you. It's, it's not that hard to use these things. Um, I, you'll see that I have several macros and they're all designed for very specific things. But one of the things when I get into my editing mode, and this is, this is after, so a lot of you know that I do a chapter in, in usually five runs of that chapter. I write a chapter in the first draft which is really just dialogue and action. And then I go through and start describing things. And then I go through and start adding emotions. And then I go through and, and do this. And the last one is, um, is dialogue where I'm looking at dialogue and does the, does the dialogue carry the scene without narration? Those are very important to me, but I consider all of that my first draft. All of that I usually do in one sitting. So it, it is time consuming. It is, it, I'm not the fastest writer because I am very anal about getting everything right. But when I'm ready to actually start editing, after it's gone out to the beta readers, after I've gotten that feedback, after I know that the chapter accomplishes what I want it to accomplish, this is when I go into, all right, I'm ready. I'm getting ready to send this to my, because I do have a professional proof editor. So when I'm in that mode, uh, the first thing I run is my bad words macro. And it is a list that is specific to me. But what it does is it goes through and words that I've designated as things here, I'll bring up just to show you how kind of insane it is. So here is the actual macro and it has different sections. So I have filtering words. So these are all words that I've added in here that are all words that, that indicate that you're probably filtering. Um, I have my bad emotions. So feel felt and hoped are things that I don't wanna see in my um, manuscripts. Not that they're not in there, just they have to be the right word. 
overuse and redundant movements. We talked about that breath, breathing, eyed, you know, turning, shifting. I don't write smooth, smooth out her skirts, but if I was Robert Jordan, that would be in here. Because the other thing is anything you put in between these quotes can be anything. So it can be a whole phrase. My passive voice, LY adverbs. I want to make sure that I'm looking at those. Overuse words. And these are words that I overuse. This is not necessarily, this again, it's, it's specific to me. And then stage direction um, is what I call these words. So like then, now, next, finally, sometimes those words are, are the right word to use. And you'll see them in, the, in this document because this document's already been gone through. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and then the other macros that you saw also have different reasons. And I'll, I'll go over at least one of those when we're finished with this. So now I'm ready to edit. And I now, I mean, you can't miss these. These, these words are right there. So here I've got gaze and eyes, which are some overused words. Look, I have gaze and gaze right here. I've left them in here because I felt it worked. But let's say there was a gaze here and an, a gaze here and a gaze here. And there, I'd be like, okay, well, I got to do something with this. But if we just look at that one color, you know, shifting, here's a gaze, but it's down here on 120. Here's a bunch right in a row, but again, there's a lot going on in here. And so um, I felt that this was about the best that I could do and I was comfortable with it. It reads fine. It doesn't read jarring or anything like that. Although I think that's the only side that I have in here. But anyway, so it just allows me to, to really look at everything individually. You know, wuzzes are always a red flag for, for passive voice, stuff like that. So I wanna take a look at those, same with heads. My LY adverbs, I want to take a look at those. Uh, here's my stage direction, then, before, before. Again, I've already gone through this, so I'm my, I'm happy with this. And so, yeah, you might go, wow, you got two befores right there. But I've read it. I've made the decision. I'm cool with it. And no one's going to pop this. Again, this is so detailed at this point that most readers aren't going to have an issue with it. Uh, the violet are my overused words. So I tend to use of the too much as too much. So I do kind of take a look at those and make sure that there are not too many of them. But by color coding these, it allows me to just have them pop off the page and just slap me in the face. And I can really read the sentence and go, can I rewrite this sentence? Can I put an and instead of an as? Can I, is there something I can do to, to, to adjust like on the of those? Would it work to, to flip it around? Where's that of the... The eight extended branches of the core family shared his side of the public apartment. So to get rid of an of the, it usually means you're going to flip it around and, and make whatever possesses. So could I write the core family's eight extended branches shared his side of the public house? Absolutely, I could flip that around. Does it read as good to my ear? And that's why I've left it the way it is because to me the core family's eight extended branches shared his side doesn't read as good to my ear as the eight extended branches of the core family shared his side it just reads it flows a little bit better for me and so I'm just going to leave it in there you know again these are all judgment calls these are all things that that I decide but look I mean there are five of those in these this one little area no one notices this stuff. No one notices of those. And so even though I pare them down as much as I can, it's still, no one pops me on my of those. You, you'd you think that, and then, you know, you get somebody who does, but they're oh. not going to do it unless there's like a lot of it. And that's the thing, like all of this, all of this color-coded macros, which I also use, you know, these things help you make sure that, you're not sitting with an entire paragraph of bad words. It, it forces you to look at this stuff. So like you can look at these two hope and I can go, oh, is that bad? And then I have to reread the whole paragraph, reread what comes before it is, and then think about, you know, do I want these in the same, you know, in two sentences? But our dairy secret hope that the anyone would be anyone other than him. Marriage would be one more hook binding him to a life he hoped to escape. Yeah, I could probably come up with a different word now that I'm thinking about it. But when I went through this, I was fine with it. No one, when you're reading that, you're going to go, oh, it's not like it's, what was it? What was the word you used? Pernicious. Permeated. My, my, my bad word is permeated. My big one. So, yeah. So you just, I make up a macro that, that kind of allows me to go through it. And then I just drill down and make sure that, do I want to use freshly baked bread? Or do I want to 
get rid of that adverb and use something else. Do a, you know, one of the things you can do with adverbs is you can just get rid of them. So yet the smells of baked bread, frying meat would read just as good. But I decided, mm, you know, I really like the, the freshly baked bread. It just kind of adds that little bit of spice that I'm looking for in this sentence. So it just allows me to look at things on a very mac micro level, sentence by sentence, and just decide, are these the words that I want to use in these sentences? Or can I just, because I already know the story works. I already know the yeah. flow of the story and everything like that. Now I'm just looking at individual sentences to decide, you know, how I sit. And really easy to get rid of them, you know, just highlight everything and get rid of the highlights. I talk about that. I do a dialogue draft and I have a macro that literally pulls out all of my dialogue. So I can just hit that and it will go through and it will highlight all of my dialogue. And it also highlight my inner model. Technically, it just highlights all um, italic words. But this is a great way for when I'm doing my dialogue draft where I'm just reading dialogue and I'm skipping everything else, all I have to do is read the yellow. And, you know, once this is all done, I can just start at the top and I can literally just go, okay, okay, okay. Since I'm writing accents, it allows me to look at the accent, see if it's consistent. I do have another macro that actually will go through. And like, if I've determined, like, like this race, this, this culture doesn't use the word, but they use the word yet. And so if I've accidentally used the word, but it'll pop it for me or the word um, today or tomorrow or yesterday, um, noon, you know, I have different words for this stuff to, to give it kind of a fantasy flair. And so it'll go through and pop those because I have them in that list of the macro that's their accents. So like the um, Hecate accents, um, Rolarthian accents, Silhouian accents, it'll go through and, and see if I've actually made those mistakes. Same thing with, with uh, if you notice there was a band words. So there are words that I do not allow to be ever said, like the word second. They don't have clocks, so they don't have seconds. So no one waits a second because second doesn't exist. So that's on this list. And that shows up light gray. So I can, once I run that, I can run through it. I don't use speech tags. So said is one of my banned words, but that's banned in everything I write. But this isn't a speech tag. This is somebody else saying the word said. So it's not that the word doesn't exist. It's that the word doesn't exist in narration. So notice it popped this gray, but it's, you know, I wouldn't have even told Bar uh, Barnett I liked him if you, if you hadn't, if you, shit, I can't even read. Had you not said I was, he was sweet on me. So I'm fine with that said because it's not a speech tag. But as long as I don't see any other gray anywhere else, then I know I haven't used, and again, this is probably nothing, as the man said, that's a piece of dialogue. He's just saying the word said, I'm fine with that. And then I'm done. And I know I haven't used any words that I don't want to use in my, because I've got about 300 words in the English language that are not allowed to be said in the Genesis Oblivion saga. That's a lot to keep up with. And sometimes you just make a mistake. Like one of the things is world. I don't use the word world. I use the word plain, and then there's a reason for it. And you learn that as you, as you go through this, but man, it is really hard not to write the word world. You know, it was like the whole world was against him. Like you, you just say this stuff and you write this stuff. So having the computer be able to go through and kind of help me m find this stuff is just really, really vital for me. Do you use uh, macros different or? No, I, I use basically the same macros. I have a bad words macro. I have a time macro. Now, specifically for me, time is very important because my cultures, my cultures tell time in different ways. Mm -hmm. So um, in Nayera's culture, they have a water clock based time system. So seconds become droplets. A little mm -hmm. bit becomes a beaker of time you know, and all of their expressions. So when they'll say something like, don't keep looking back at the past, they'll say something like, don't fill the clock with tears, husband, things like that. And in Louis's case, they tell time with a candle clock. So it's flickers and so on. And then they'll say things like, I've run out of wick, as in I'm out of time, or the wax has melted, as in a lot of time has passed, things like that. I uh, said, so yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's hard to keep up with on the fly when you're just writing it. So yes. letting the macro kind of double check to make sure you've done that. I, my, my macros highlight not just the time words, but also English time expressions. So mm -hmm. I look for specific things like time, run out of, 
um, you know, all of those kinds of words that, that show that I have an opportunity here to do a time expression. That's why, if you notice, there was a different macro for each of the different um, cultures, because like Rorthians don't say will, they say shall, but Hecites don't say shall, they say will. And so that's a lot to keep up with in a, you know, 200,000 word novel. And so I just, when I have, if I don't have any Hecites in the scene, I don't have to run that macro. If I don't have any Rorthians, I don't have to run that macro. Um, and they are different colors. So if there are, you know, Hecites and Rorthians in the same scene, they're going to show up as different colors anyway, to kind of make sure they go, okay, no, that, that shall is definitely said by a Rorthian and that will is said by a Hecite. And so it just, again, it's just how I decided to do their accents. It's decided how I wanted to make a little bit of a uniqueness to the world. And so it helps me uh, kind of go through it. There's one other thing we should talk about in Word, and that is the custom dictionary. I, I have a very amazing keyboard. Uh, as you can see right there. See, my swanky keyboard has got like umlauted characters and things on it. But most of you will have the standard American keyboard, which does not have any of those. <laughs> so, and having to type those things by finding out their ASCII code is really annoying. So to get to what we're talking about, well, are you going to talk about uh, replacement or are you going to talk about the custom dictionary? The custom dictionary. So right. I think that if you if you do your custom dictionary, because yours probably has more than mine, because mine, like, I just have these custom characters on my keyboard. <laughs> right. Well, if you go file, options, and then you go into proofing. So there's two things that, that, that I use. One is the autocorrect options, uh, and the other is the custom dictionary. The custom dictionary for me really is just, because I hate, since I make up so many words, I hate all those red lines everywhere. What I do with a custom dictionary is normally it's just set to your normal custom. I always make my own. I do not store it in Word. I store it on my OneDrive. So if I have to format or whatever, um, like with the Realm of the Dying Sun, we have a custom dictionary and I just formatted on a computer and I haven't worked on the Realm since then, so, which is why it's not showing up in this list, but it's actually on our shared OneDrive. So we all are sharing the same text file for that. The only thing I have to remember is when I'm writing on the realm, I have to go in here and change it, uh, set it to the default for the realm. And then when I'm working on the Genesis, I have to set it to that. And then when I'm not working on anything, like if my wife's going to use it or whatever, I don't want her adding stuff to either of my custom dictionaries. So I have to remember to change the default back to just the regular custom dictionary. Um, but all it is is a text file. And so it's just a list of your kind of unique words that are in there. So that if you misspell it, you can right click on it. And it'll be one of your choices if you're close enough to allow it to know what you were saying. But what it doesn't do, like if you have academia in here, notice my little academia has a little dilly bob above the E. If I type in academia and spell it correctly without the little dilly bob above the E, because it's in my custom dictionary now, it'll be like, okay, that's close enough for me. I don't, you don't need the little dilly bob. So it won't pop that. As, as wrong, even though it's got the little dealy bob above it. So the way I handle that is with this autocorrect options up here. So autocorrect is different. What autocorrect is, is when I type parentheses C parentheses, it's gonna do a, a copyright circle. When I type this, it's gonna type that. Now these are all in here for Word. I didn't put these in here. What I did put is, I did put academia. So I put, when I write academia without the E, you add the little dilly bob above the D. So what this allows me to do is I just type in, and when I hit space, it changes it, adds the little dilly bob above the E. So like with the realm, I went, uh, one of the races language is heavily based off of, uh, off of Swedish. And so there is several words that have the, the double dots over the uh, over the vowels or whatever. And when I pitch that to the other writers, they're like, I don't want to type this crap. What are you talking about? I'm like, no, no, you don't type it. Uh, and I don't even like some of them, I don't even want to remember how they're spelled. There's something called a Dortrad, but I just type in the word door tree because that's what it is. It's a, it's a door in a tree. And so I just type in door tree. When I hit space, 
It changes it to door trod with the, the correct little dots above where they're supposed to be, and I'm fine. And so if you do have a, a really complex word that you just don't want to type over and over again, technically you get really lazy. Like if you don't even want to type a church's word and you just want to type in three initials, and every time you type these three initials, it just automatically puts the character's name. You can do that. But that's actually where, so if you've ever wondered about how word knows to change your commonly misspelled words, like a lot is actually two words. So if you type in a lot, you'll notice that word automatically just puts a space in there. It's because it's in this list. If, you ever want, if that annoys you, if you're like, no, 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 I want a lot to be one word, you just come in here and delete this. If you, or, or if there's a, there's a, if there's a typo, like one of the things that I always do is I, there's several words that because of my dyslexia, I write wrong every single time. And so I will go in here instead of me having to backspace and correct it every single time or right click on or whatever, because I just put a couple of the letters out of order or whatever. I will put the way I spell it as the, you know, what I want you to replace. And then I'll put the correct way in the replace it with. And that way, if I put an I and E out of order, because I always do it on this word, it just automatically fixes it for me and I don't have to worry about it. So using the strength of the tools that are built into Word is very important in my opinion. You know, you really can save yourself a lot of time and a lot of headaches just by these two things, just your custom dictionary, so that you don't have all the underlined red words. And also if you misspell one of your character names, which I do all the time, uh, it'll have an E in it and I'll actually put an I in it because that's the way my dyslexia works. They sound the same to me. Your city names, city names yeah. or something I often misspell. And so it'll show up red and you'll know that you, if, if it's in your custom dictionary, you'll know, oh, I misspelled that. And you can get that fixed. If it is something you always do or a word you don't want to type, you can just come up with something like I'll never type the word door tree as one word ever. Never will I write the word door tree. So I chose that so that when I type in door tree, you change it to door drive. With Elamar, when I was typing on my English keyboard, because I do have a standard USA keyboard as well. Um, for, for some other typing things, for code typing primarily. And uh, on that one, I did program in that Elamar, I just type without the dots on the A's and it puts the dots on the A's in. Yeah. It's just a way to save yourself some time and also some headache and make sure it's spelled right. And, and again, why not take advantage of this stuff? So that's really the, the things that I use in Word. I use the custom dictionary I use to help me make sure I'm spelling all my character names the same way and city names and all that. I use the replace if there's something very specific. I don't want to retype academia every single time with that stupid little E, yep. you know, with the dealing bomb. So I'll just go ahead and now I can just type in academia and it'll replace it with what I want it to look like. And to add things to your dictionary, it's just right click on them and add them to your dictionary if they're misspelled. Um, so like Rid Hale, this is the name, this is the name of the city. I added to the dictionary. Like I said, I just formatted so it doesn't have everything in it that it should have. Because I decided to make a new dictionary with this new editing run through it, just in case the old one had crap in it that I don't want. Because the other thing that I use the dictionary for is I use that to help me create my glossary at the end of the book. Because now every single word that I've made up is in this beautiful text file. Now other words are in there, like word doesn't like the word ain't. Word doesn't like the word you know, whatever. There's like uh, copes, a copes of trees. Since I write fantasy, I use some some of the older terms for stuff. It doesn't like that word. And so I don't want it to be underlined in red. So I'll put that in the dictionary too, just so I don't have to look at the stupid red mark. Obviously that's not going in the, the glossary at the end of the book. If you want to know what a copes looks like, it's a real word. You can just Google it. But, you know, I can use that text document to help me make sure that I get my glossary set up the way I want, or my pronunciation guide it's really what I call it because I just want you to know how to how to pronounce the words that I have in there macros and it, it, there's not enough time in the day to teach how to make a macro you're really going to have to kind of do that do the research on it I might make mine available like I said send me an email maybe I'll I'll send you some of it, it, it it's a lot of effort and work and so it's also personal to me sometimes so it's not something that I'm 100% excited to share but you know whatever I'm a pretty giving guy um so that's this. There's one other thing that I use though. And I think this is, and this is the very last thing that I do. And I've gotten to the point where I may not actually have my proof editor. I'm going to have her do this book because um, this is a new tool that I've added recently. I don't know if I'm going to need a proofreader after this. So I don't know if it's going to be worth the money 
to spend on that after this. We'll see. I'll see what she can catch. But there's a, a tool called Pro Writing Aid that I really, really like. It's $80 a year since we priced it. It's 80 bucks a year. So, so not what, seven, too expensive. Yeah, seven bucks a month or something like that. 80 bucks a year, even if you're only doing one book a year and you're paying a proof editor 1500 bucks, um, yeah. it's a lot cheaper than that. Uh, it does a lot. Now, this is a lot like Grammarly. I don't like Grammarly for, for a plethora of different reasons. I despise Grammarly for one reason. It invades your computer. Mm -hmm. Like it is suddenly everywhere. It's on your web browsers. It's in your emails. It's just everywhere. I'm like, no, go away. <laughs> so Pro Writing Aid has a desktop version, which is what you see here, which I think has a lot more tools and flexibility to it. But it has an online version. So you can log into your account and you can do everything there. But you don't get all the tools. It does a lot. I do use the grammar and spelling. And if you notice... It doesn't like my spelling. It thinks that I'm very bad because you're supposed to have 100% here. Aim for zero mistakes in your work and you have a bunch of mistakes. Well, actually I don't. There's no mistakes in here. If we look at the Grammarly report or the grammar report, it picks out like ain't and it picks out words like garter, which is just a word, you know, that I don't use the word guards. Uh, there's twice where, because this race doesn't say my. So, you know, if it says... Um, give me back my book, this race would say, give me back me book. And so it doesn't like that It's because that's improper grammar. Um, so if you go through here and look at these, it's a lot of words that, that are just, it doesn't like the fact that like tested is capitalized, but tested is a capitalized. It's a, it's a special thing in this. It isn't just tested. And so there's things like that in here that, that it'll pop out live in because I've dropped the G's, considering, because I dropped the G's, flirting, embarrassing, Miram is a made up word, Atal is a made up word. So that's why my grammar sucks as far as it's concerned. I do still go through it because it did, uh, there were a few times where I was like, oh crap, I did miss that one or I did misspell that one or whatever. So I'll go through that. I'll go through, um, you know, it, it does something like sentence variation, which is really, really cool because you do want to make sure that your sentences are varied. I do this naturally. And so you can look through and see there's only six long sentences, but this is the sentence by sentence breakdown. So the first sentence is nine words long. The next one is 12, then 22, then 12, then four, then seven, then three. So you can kind of see that there is no pattern because that's what you don't want. You don't want pattern. You also don't want like an 82 word sentence. So you can look at your long sentences this way and see, but as long as there's this huge variation here, you know that you've done a really good job of varying your sentence structure and, and making sure that the read is going to be interesting and, and everything like that. This is probably a, a, either an emotional moment in the story or a, um, an action part of the story, because I will get really short in, in this type of stuff. So there's something going on here. And cool thing is we can go look at it. What I do look at um, in this, I use, like I said, I, I look at the grammar and I go through it line by line to see if there's uh, anything. I don't write any passive voice, so I don't have to worry about, about that. Um, I don't use emotional tells or anything like that. It pops me for dialogue tags, but I don't write dialogue tags. So it's, it's wrong on these. And when you look at them, like there was one line that we looked at that it says that, that I use a dialogue tag in this paragraph and there's no dialogue in the paragraph. Like, so I can't be using a dialogue tag. There's just some key words that it just says, oh, that's got to be a dialogue tag because it's this word. And I'm just, and, and it's not. Um, same thing with dialogue tags with adverbs. Well, there's no dialogue tag, so there's no adverb. So I know that these are incorrect. Um, but the, the things that I do like about it are um, repetitive words and echoes. Those are two that I, I really do go through and look at. It takes a minute to do the to the to do the repetitive. What the repetitive is going to look at is going to go through the entire document and see if you've used the same. It'll give you five. Like there's the first one will be use these same five words in this order twice, but it's a, a title. There's a thing in this called the Twelve Gods of Man, and so you'll see in here that in this chapter I use the the those five words, the Twelve Gods of Man, twice. I'm like, yeah, but that's a title and I know where it's at. And so it, but it even goes down to the single words. Now, it also picks every single word. Like, our dairy is the POV character in this. So it says, you used our dairy 78 times. I'm like, yeah, 78 times in a 5,000 word chapter because he is the POV character. You know, it'll say, you use the word he this many times or whatever. And it's like, okay, great. Most of those. But what I'm looking for is like your um, pernicious. 
if there's a if there's a unique word in there that shows up twice, that's when I'm going to go, OK, one of these is gone. I'm going to kill one of these. Like I said, I don't know if I can do the you see how long it's taken just for this 5000 words. I don't know if I can throw the whole 200000 word you know novel in here to see if I've used pernicious six times in the whole thing because I'd have to go on vacation <laughs> and my rig is as beefy as it comes. I would probably not run, I would probably not run my whole document through it. Um, but, you know, if you pick up a word, like a word that's a little bit like tricky or whatever, it might be worth just putting it into word search and seeing how many right. times it comes up. Because that's that a real easy way to check for repeated content. <laughs> I do that on the fly. If I'm typing along and, and there's a word that I, that I want to use in this sentence, but I'm like, how? I feel like I've used this word already in the chapter. Like it's yeah, but th that's why it's useful for me to have the the whole document because it lets me go like in this whole document, how many right. times have I used this word? <laughs> yep. You can open up the search um, palette, just type in pernicious, and then hit search, and it will actually tell you not only how many there are, but you, it'll actually link to each one of them, so you can actually bounce through it. All right, so it's finally finished. So what it's done is it's gone through and it's looked at every single word in the document. And notice, like, here's my five word phrases, the 12 gods of man. Already talked about it. It's there. Look at our four word phrases in front of him. I've looked at them. I'm fine with them. The communal dining hall. There's twice. But notice there's only two of each of these. Uh, kept his voice low. Yeah. Could I rewrite it? And he whispered or whatever. Sure, I could. Um, but they were so far apart in this document that I'm like, you know what? I'm good with them. Three word phrases, two word phrases, and so on and so forth. And so I do go through and I look at these. Um, to see, you know, do I need 13 times of his cousin? Yeah, because it's it's actually a pronoun. His cousin, because I'm using his cousin and Sim back and forth, his father, you know, his mind, do I need it seven times? Actually, I think it was like 10 or 12 times when I first went in here. And I was like, you know what? Let me look through them, see what I can do. And you can just bounce through them using this. And it just lets me look at it. And then, you know, same thing with one word. So our dare is used six times. Yeah, which is you is used 44 and I, it might not even pop you because I don't see it popping common words like he and the yeah. and was. So since ya, yeah, since I'm, this race doesn't say you for the most part, they say yeah, it's going to pop that on me. But that's really just the word you. That's all it is. But what I can do is I can look at, notice every one of these are common words. So heed, even, eyes. Now, eyes is something I would definitely look at you know, here, same thing with hand. Again, I've gone through this document. So I've made the decision that I'm fine with 11 eyes and 11 hands in this 5,000 word document. They're far enough apart that it doesn't do anything to me. But notice there's no words like pernicious used twice or grading used twice or whatever, haunches used twice. So those are the ones that I'm really concerned about is if if I've used a, a very strong, unique word that should only be used once in the chapter, it'll pop it in here. It'll show me that I've used it twice. Hmm. And so I can go, okay, well, I'm going to get rid of one of these. And it may have been, I don't remember. It's been a while since I've, I've gone through this chapter. Um, so maybe there was a big word that was used in here once or twice. I mean, two or three times. And I've, I've gone through and, and eliminated those. So this is one thing that I like to use. And then I also like to use um, the echoes, which is kind of the same thing. Um, but a little bit different. And so uh, those are two features that I really appreciate. It's worth, it's worth the money to me just to have those two things to be able to look at because it's hard to catch your duplicates sometimes. Um, and then also, like I said, the grammar. I caught some stuff that, was, that amazed me that, that usually the proof editor is the only one who catches. So like I said, I'm going to be testing out my proof editor with this version because once it's all done, I may save myself, you know, 1500 bucks a book. I, I have to say that things that'll catch your repeated words and your echoes is worth their weight in gold because, yeah. you know, we say readers don't catch it, but they do. They do when they say, you know, there was something about the book I didn't really like. Like, I kept, like, you know, the first time I read about her spine cracking, I was like, man, that spine's doing a lot of cracking. Like, they don't yeah. notice it the way a, a writer would notice it, but they notice it in their experience. So it's just things that are, are kind of kind of close. Uh, it gives you suggestions, but like, 
you know, here's woke and woke, work and work. Again, I've already looked at this. So like we read this, uh, Ridhill, Ridhill Stead was already awake and preparing for another day's work. Even this early, people milled about the cobble, cobbled streets, either running a quick errand or heading to their assigned work details. I, I, I could change the top one to another day's labor, but I don't like the sound of that as much as another day's work. The two works are not, that big of a deal to me so you know just it just allows you to look at like our dairy head our dairy had walls and walls there's almost no words you can use for walls so some of these words like you're just stuck with sometimes i do it um for cadence so like this uh yet working a communal farm until he was a broken back old man wasn't his idea of of, of a satisfying life he had no, no clue what a satisfying life looked like. So using that word in succession is on purpose because it gives this kind of like comparison between, I don't think this is a satisfying life, not that I know what the hell that is. Mm -hmm. So could I use a different word there? Sure, but it doesn't have the cadence that I want. So the echoes just really allow me to go through and you can look at you know where things are in relation to each other. And again, I've already gone through here, so I'm I'm satisfied with all these. This gets really nitpicky. And here's the thing about editing. I guess this is, a, this is where we'll end on. You can edit forever. You can literally edit forever. But at some point, if you want anyone else to read this book, you have to stop editing. You have to eventually get to a point where you're like, you know what? This is actually really good. Um, I'll tell my story with, with, one of the things, so I worked with uh, Larry Elmore on a, on a project, on a graphic novel back in 2015. If you don't know who Larry Elmore is, he is probably one of the most famous fantasy illustrators in the industry. He did half the art for Dungeons Dragons while TSR owned Dungeons Dragons. Very, very, very famous um, illustrator. And so I was at his studio, which is in Kentucky, and he's a fan of mine, talking about re you know my writing and everything like that. And I was talking about how much I pushed myself you know, how much that I really, I, I, I'm, I'm never ending trying to become a better writer every single day. And he was like, why? You're an amazing writer. Like, I love your stuff. And I'm like, well, thank you. But, but there's things I could do better. There's things, I mean, even like looking at this stuff, it, it bothers me because I'm like, ah, really, I got quick twice in that one paragraph. I'm run, do I really, like, I just, I, I get this itch that I'm like, mm. um, but it's fine. It's fine. And what he said to me is he said, look, I used to be just like you. Like, I knew I could draw this finger better. I knew I could draw this ear better. I knew I could draw this eyebrow better. And he goes, and then my, you know, his mentor came up to him one day and he was like, what are you doing? Because he had been drawing this one ear, he said. And it was like the fourth time, fifth time he'd drawn this one ear. And he said, well, I, I, I can just do this better. I can just, this ear, I can just, and he's like, his mentor said to him, who's going to notice? Who's going to notice in the fandom that this year that you're drawing for the fifth time is better than the year that you drew for the second time. He's like, sure, you might notice, I might notice, but maybe five other people in the world will notice. And that really woke him up and made him go, hmm, yeah, maybe I am kind of being a little too nitpicky. So that's kind of where I'm at is I have to struggle against my OCD of having everything to be perfect and striving for that that absolute pinnacle of, of perfection that you cannot reach no one can reach it versus yeah I'm this is fantastic everyone freaking loves it there's not a single beta reader that's popped anything on it it's gonna just go to print I'm just gonna get it out there and so, yes, I do use these tools because they do help me. Because the nice thing is, is before these tools, I would edit 15, 18, 20 times. I would reread the same chapter over and over again because I was like, I know I'm missing something. I know I'm missing an echo. I know I'm missing a repeated word. I know I'm missing something. And so I would read and read and read and reread and, and so on and so forth. And, and really what these tools have helped me to do is I do my five drafts. I get them out to my beta readers. I get those notes back in. I do one more draft using all of their notes. At that point, I do my bad word macro. I look at my accents and everything like that, make sure I'm done. I run it through pro writing aid and I'm finished. 
I am going to, you know, the only thing now is to send it to the proof editor, let her go through it and do everything. But I do that in big chunks, but I'm done. I'm, it, it, it gives me, it gives me a spot where I can go, you know what? You've looked at everything. You've honed in on everything. You've made the decision that it's good enough. Let it go. Yeah, you're done. Don't go back into that chapter. And I think that that is a great note to end this podcast. If you want to support either of us, there are links down below to our Amazon profiles. Drake's got a fairy tale book out. I have my Sangwheel Chronicles out. So you can hit those and uh, buy our books and leave reviews and all those great stuff. And we will see you soon for another episode. Bye.